So, hi guys, I'm, uh, I'm Sean, I'm a, uh, from Lionsgate Hospital, and I'm a trauma team leader there, an emergency doc, and I'm also um, the director of the trauma service there at, at Lionsgate and for the last five years. And we've been uh, learning a lot from uh, each other and building a, a strong team. And I just want to share with you some of our experiences and how you guys might take those experiences and apply them to where you work. Uh, so I've got no conflicts of interest. And these are the objectives. I just want to review some cases, some selected cases from our Sea to Sky corridor. And I want to discuss some issues that uh, we've had dealing with these high acuity but low opportunity events, these halo events um, in, our, in our community emergency department. So this talk is not about sexy pre-hospital medicine. This is not about, uh, I, you know, I, I work on the Whistler Patrol. There was a, a, a case up on Seppos here in the spring, a snowboarder uh, in his 20s who ruptured his aorta and went from the Whistler Patrol, uh, had a Whistler dock on scene, went uh, to the clinic and air ambulance down to VGH, uh, had surgery, 50 units of blood, and walked out of the hospital a month later. And just kind of a testament uh, to our trauma system and when it works well, it can work really well. It's not about that sexiness. It's, uh, it's certainly not about the stabbings that Whistler sometimes sees. And these Whistler here, they, uh, they work um, in, uh, you know, up to 10 p.m. And a lot of these stabbings hap happen overnight. And there's, there's, uh, there was a recent one in February and a death back in uh, 2015. And they try to do a lot with limited resources there. It's not about uh, North Shore Rescue, which I've been a resource member um, uh, for the last year and a half and really enjoy the experience uh, getting out there in the woods and, and doing some of this, uh, this kind of extraction, pre-hospital medicine. But the principles still apply uh, in my talk on, on how, how you prepare for these kind of events. It's also not about transport issues. Uh, how many people in the room are from a rural center? Right, so at least half of you, um, and I've worked in a lot of rural places, and you, know, you often find yourself trying to run a resuscitation while you're on the phone with Patient Transfer Network, uh, trying to get these patients out of your department. But that's a talk unto itself. My passion is about teamwork, and we have this sign in our nursing um, unit, and I smile every time I go, go past it. So what do I mean by that? You know, uh, we have developed over the years uh, a very robust uh, sim system. We've developed um, a lot of teamwork and resilience, and I'm super proud of how well our team works. And there's always, always room for improvement, and we continue to work on that quality every day. This is a snapshot of our, our last summer here. So we see a lot of stuff out of Whistler, mountain bike injuries and ski and snowboard injuries in the winter. Um, so the majority of the stuff that actually comes is high energy sports mechanism. Uh, we do see a lot of falls, particularly in the elderly, and then the balance of that is motor vehicle crashes. Who are you guys? So, uh, anybody work in a medium-sized center, like a Lionsgate-type center? We've got a couple. Anyone work in the big house in VGH? No, they don't, they don't want to come to this, this conference. Uh, so, um, how many people have some kind of trauma on call? A couple, yeah, so it's another doc maybe, yeah, so a second doc maybe come in. How many people utilize their paramedics uh, in their resuscitations? Yeah, good. And how many nurses, uh, who has more than one nurse? Who's got more than two? More than three? Yeah, sometimes, maybe, all right. So small teams, uh, difficult environments, uh, hard, hard to manage, right? So this is a good touchstone on what we're dealing with here. Okay, your ETA is five minutes with the GS Hopefully you seen the it. Base out. Who's this patient? Hey, John, a 32-year-old male, gunshot wound to the left chest. In here. Get the attending and get the trauma team. What have we got? We have a 32-year-old male, gunshot to the chest, BP 100 over 60. Pulse 112, respiration 28. Are you ready to move him? He's awake and alert. Two peripheral IVs in. One, two, three. Wait a minute. Lactated ringers hanging, no meds given. What's your name? John, John Mason. Airway's clear. 
Good, good primary survey. Calm. Pretty calm. Who's the O2 connection? Who's the O2? Scissoring him. I need to listen here. Let's get an X-ray down here. We have decreased breast down to the left side. I need a chest tube set up. He's 120 over 76. I'd appreciate some heads up on trauma. What do we got here? It's a 32-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the left chest. Midclavicular, second of the costal space. DP in the field is 110 over 60. On the right, over 76. No, he's in the field. Pulse is 137. X-ray is on its way down. We have decreased breath sounds on the left side. Where's that chest tube? Chest tube. I'll do it. He's losing his vitals. Pressure's 80. I need an ATG now. Let's get some blood in this guy. Seven and a half, two. Let's get four units. Hello? His pressure's 60. He's crashing. We have blood coming down. down. We need four units of blood. I got it. Has he got any pulses? I'm not getting a pulse. So what do you guys notice from that? How was the, how was the initial uh, pre-hospital report? So not bad. I mean, he, he, got, he got, the, got the report, kind of, then he probably went to go see that guy who was screaming in the other room, so he didn't tell anybody else. Uh, how did you guys uh, like the, um, the initial survey? Not awesome, right? I mean, he's not, not really delegating tasks. He's got his head right in the patient. He doesn't have very good situational awareness. Any other things you guys noticed? There was no preparation. So no preparation, right? So there were no assignment of roles. There was no uh, introduce, introduction of the team. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they just arrived in the, in the recess bay after the patient arrived, right? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, nobody, everybody's shouting uh, out orders, and nobody really knows who's following them. Uh, where's my chest tube? Uh, hello, and so anyway, he's, he's uh, very frustrated, obviously, and, and uh, there are ways to mitigate this kind of loss of control. This is Halo, so my son's a 12-year-old, uh, he loves superheroes, and uh, I don't think he knows about this one, but Halo was on the Batman, Team Batman, um, and she had uh, the colors of the rainbow that were all Halos that gave her uh, powers of flight and tractor beam and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but Halo is also a, uh, a high acuity, low opportunity event, and that's where the zone of simulation exists. And when you talk about these things, the, um, the high acuity, high opportunity event up in the upper, upper right, can you guys think of anything like that? So, what's up? In major centers, you're seeing, you're seeing the, the, the halos lots, so they become halos, yeah. Maybe, yeah, uh, that could, that's, that's possible. The, in, in not so major centers, you see, like for example, uh, OB centers, they see postpartum hemorrhage quite frequently, which can be quite acute, but, um, but and you also have a high opportunity to see it. Low acuity, low opportunity, uh, the common example is uh, fecal disimpaction. Um, and low acuity and high opportunity are things we do every day in the eMERGE, suturing, um, Maybe uh, in the OR, um, low-risk uh, elective intubation or anesthesia. The Queen, back in 1992, she, uh, she coined the term anis horribilis when uh, members of the royal family were seen topless uh, and in the tabloids, and Princess Di and Diana got divorced. Um, but we also, in our shop, had an April horribilis when we had uh, three very um, impactful events where we had a hanging in the eMERGE, we had a... Uh, and these two traumas that I'm going to tell you guys about. And, <clears throat> sorry, um, the, the shit, coming shitstorm here is a gunshot wound, um, multiple gunshot wounds to a young female that's two blocks from Lionsgate Hospital on the mean streets of North Vancouver. Now, we don't see a lot of gunshot wounds. Um, who here has seen a GSW in their shop? Maybe half of you. Um, we're not the United States here, so we don't see this very often. So how do you prepare for this kind of thing? So you got the shitstorm coming. You're, you're trying not to do what that guy was doing. You're assembling your team. You're calling a pre-hospital activation. You're, um, you're getting uh, overhead calls so that lab and DI and x-ray are coming in. You're calling in extra help, the trauma team leader from the community. And so that's, all this is happening in the background while this patient's coming in in a matter of minutes. How do you remain calm in the situation? How do you control yourself? How do you prevent loss of control in how you think 
how, what your heart rate is and how you might uh, prepare for this and respond to this and become a good leader. So I was the ED, uh, I was on the, in the ED that day, I was on the acute side, so it was up to me. I was, the, I was the team leader to start with until the trauma team leader showed up. And I got the thoracotomy tray out and I called the surgeon um, who was on his way in. So she comes in, gets rolled in. She's in a C-collar. Uh, we learned from Aaron Kenny's talk yesterday that C-collars and penetrating trauma really are, is not a great idea. It interferes with, especially if you have uh, any wounds around the head or neck. And um, multiple gunshot wounds. She's got wounds in her right cheek. She's got a, a wound in the back of her neck. She's got two wounds on the right wrist, probably from defensive mechanism. And there's some blood at the scene. So initially, uh, we didn't really get that history from ambulance uh, because of the chaos in the emergency room. The entire hospital uh, had shown up in our recess bay, it seemed, that day. And the initial rhythm was narrow complex, and we couldn't really get a pulse. Just a snapshot of, uh, we, we, we still use uh, written nursing notes for our traumas because we find it uh, more effective than our, our EMR. And, you know, throughout we had no signs of life. PEA, narrow complex. We're using ultrasound, and the ultrasound showed cardiac activity with um, good contractions, but a very empty right ventricle. So what's, what's happening in this patient? Number one, bleeding. Number two, bleeding. <laughs> Number three, bleeding. And then other causes of, of, uh, of, of uh, PEA arrest in this patient. So hypovolemia. So this patient got 10 units of PRBCs. 12 units of platelets, uh, 10 units of cryo, 6 units of FFP. This is all just in the ED. And interestingly, his patient also got lots of epi and normal saline, which is kind of an ACLS thing. And lots of CPR was happening. So are we running an ACLS code or are we running an ATLS code? And there was a lot of confusion there. Um, and it, it's hard not to do CPR on someone that doesn't have pulses. But there is a lot of evidence that doing CPR interferes with other procedures that you need to do in the chest. So we had a return to spontaneous circulation after about five units of blood and some FFP. And we eventually got this patient to the uh, CT. But before that, we did an x-ray with the tube in a good place and otherwise looked good. We did a skull x-ray, uh, which was someone's good idea in the recess bay. And we saw you know, uh, um, the bullets. And one was outside, one was inside the skull. We got them to the CT scanner and still pretty unstable. Uh, we did get ahead. But before we got ahead, we got the scout film, which uh, just showed the bullets in the head and nothing else. So we decided just to do to the head and get them back to recess bay. Just a shot of the tract of the bullet. And it's sort of extending towards the left ear there. So what went well, what didn't go well? I mean, as it turns out, this woman had a rupture uh, of the um, the top of her internal carotid, which is probably what killed her. Uh, and when you go back and talk to police after, there was a lot of blood at the scene, uh, more, more than the cup that was advertised. The level one transfuser wasn't working very well. We had to use pressure bags for blood. We uh, had a delay in getting blood from the blood bank. The massive transfusion protocol is a pull protocol in our shop where it, it's not a push, where it just keeps arriving. They use push protocols in the big house where um, they're going to use that blood for other things like thoracic surgery. But in our shop, we have to, we have to ask for it. And seven minutes was unacceptable. And, uh, and certainly, we changed that in the, in the months afterward. And the level one transfuser has been fixed. The problem has been fixed. But how do you debrief after a quick event like this? And the Calgary model is info. So it's immediate, as, as quickly as possible after your, your resuscitation. You're not assessing yourself, you're not, and most people, they start with the conversation with what they did wrong. Um, it's, it's more about how the team did, and we give fast facilitated feedback either by the charge nurse or the doc who's there if they, they have time, and opportunity to ask questions. And this kind of thing is we try to do for every CTAS-1 that goes through a recess bay, and we have been finding it very helpful and effective and really lowers stress levels and in, improves learning from each and every one of these cases. So compressions are out, um, really, for traumatic arrest, unless you're really unsure whether there's a medical cause. Ultrasound is in. It's uh, super, super helpful, as you know, for fast and pericardiocentesis and 
uh, blood in the chest, um, blood in the belly, uh, looking for cardiac contractility. Finger thoracostomies are very helpful if there's any um, thought that there might be penetrating trauma in, um, in the chest and, or blunt trauma, and those are followed by chest tubes. And then you're going to be considering opening the chest because this patient is dead or almost dead or mostly dead. Second case uh, is, and I'm wearing a t-shirt, I'm not going to undress for you, but uh, ride, ride for Ollie. So Ollie was a four-year-old, is a four-year-old who uh, was in, what basically fell out of a two-story window uh, at his parents' house in the spring. And his parents happened to work at our hospital, and his, his uh, dad is one of our nurses. And this made it extremely difficult for our team to uh, deal with, both at the time and in the, in the days and weeks and months following. And it's affected me more than any other case in recent memory. So I got this text uh, from, from a buddy of mine who's at a, at, uh, who was working in Emerge. And I'm at my guitar lesson. I'm the trauma team leader that day. And I, uh, my, my son's very, <laughs> he's already passed me in guitar, doing really well. Uh, I kind of suck. But <clears throat> basically, I get this text, heads up, possible pediatric code 99, fall from the window. And we'll let you know. And so basically, I, I pawn my son off on, on, my, uh, on the other father in the class. And I get in the car. And I actually pass a bunch of emergency vehicles on the way in. And it turns out that's actually where Ollie had fallen out of the window. And so we kind of arrive at the same time. And the, the team is, is busy. And the, the handover from ambulance is that the kid's GCS was, was 8 to 10 at the scene, intermittent crying, and then no, no response. Uh, he's got a lot of blood coming out of his right ear. And that was about it. The rest of his vitals were OK. So the team has already done what they do in every pediatric recess. They get out the Brazo tape. They've got, they've got their Pedistat on their phone, which is Brazo, Brazo on your phone. They've got, uh, they've got out the pediatric blades for the CMAC and the direct laryngoscope and the, um, uh, all the, intubate, all the t tricks for in the difficult intubations. We've got the IOs for, for access, all different sizes. And then we've got uh, this transracheal vet uh, 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 jet ventilation setup, um, which we use in our, our, uh, our shop, which um, is helpful for young kids that you, you can't do an open crack. This is a picture of our recess bay, and you can see the wayfinding on the, on the floor and how it's set up with our whiteboard. Uh, this was the whiteboard from that day, so uh, you know this is the pre-hospital. I just took a quick shot of it, so um, you know that's his, that's his weight, 16. He's uh, 16 kilos, that's what we're going, going by on the, on the Braslow, and a quick history, and then the prehistory kind of information. And that, that whiteboard got filled up uh, during the recess. Here's a, here's a nursing note. So we couldn't really see much sign of trauma on, on Ollie. Um, he had abrasions over his back but, and, and some crepitus in his, in his uh, uh, occiput. And then left ear had hemotympanum, and right ear had lots of blood coming out of the canal, which is which was really distressing for us because it, it kept picking up speed. And he seemed to have some white stuff coming out of his ear, which everyone thought was brain. And uh, meanwhile, uh, his parents are in the room. And we know his parents. And everyone is on high, high stress, high alert. And it's, um, it, was, it was quite the scene. Things went well for the recess. Uh, you'll note there it lasted almost two hours uh, to and from the CT scanner. and. Lots of blood and lots of swelling noted in, in the kid's skull. And as you know, young skulls can swell quite a lot. This is a picture of his, uh, we got him intubated, got him to the scanner. This is a shot of his uh, occiput and, and um, you know, quite, a, quite an extensive um, fracture, which extended all the way over to the other side. C-spine was fine. We ended up doing a pan scan on this kid because we weren't messing around. Um, it's a very life-threatening injury. Don't pan scan a lot of kids these days. but. Um, we did. Uh, we, we went down, uh, and in his chest, well, I initially thought this was blood in his chest, but it turns out it's a collapsed lung because we, we did a right main stem bronchus. So that, that kind of helped me. So an extensive, comminuted right-sided skull fracture, and he's got blood in his in intraventricular, subarachnoid, subdural. He's got he's got blood um, everywhere in the brain, mostly on the right side. And he's got shift of about five millimeters. He's got uh, collapse of the ventricles. So I'm looking at this. I've seen a lot of adult brains and thinking, yeah, it's probably not surgical right now anyway. Um, but I've got a um, neurosurgeon on the phone. Uh, he's actually operating. So I'm talking on the speaker in the OR. And, and he's got um, 
a uh, uh, he's got a, the images on the um, on the screen. The nurse surgeon says, "Yeah, no, no surgery. Get him over to Children's. And why isn't the head of the bed up at 30 degrees?" And we're saying, "Sorry," and we put that up. And so there was no infant transport team that day. So it was just me and the RT and the ambulance crew. I'm not a transport doc, but I took everything I could think of. I took some, some Dilantin, I took some Dazlam, some fentanyl. Uh, I took extra intubation equipment, and I got, I'm sitting in the back of this ambulance on the way to Children's, and I'm gonna meet the family over there, and I am just reflecting on how much this has affected our team, and how, how everyone is, is gonna be extremely upset uh, you know, immediately after and in the, in the days and weeks to come. And, and how, how do we prepare for this kind of thing emotionally? And that kind of went through my head immediately. Quick and dirty on pediatric TBI, so hypothermia is out if it was ever in. Corticosteroids are still out. You want to be on the lower end of normal for PCA, PACO2. Had a bit of 30. You can give hypertonic saline or mannitol, take your pick. And in the ICU, CSF diversion, barbiturates, neuromuscular blockade. Nothing else seems to help. Surgery sometimes. You guys know uh, Cliff Reed. He's, uh, he's a very good speaker, New South Wales and Australia. And this is his slide stolen from one of his talks. And he's, uh, he's got a lot of talks on the mind of the resuscitationist. And he talks about four domains whenever you're, you're doing this kind of um, uh, resuscitation. And I'll talk about each, each of them in turn here. The self. So, you know, we had those three stressful events in April, but this is on the background of a prolonged flu season and bed block and nursing shortages and everyone is stressed and anxious and there, there's, this, this was actually the worst time for these things to happen in our department. How do we prepare for this? How do we mitigate stress in the department? Because we know it's coming. Let's talk about resilience. What's the resilience bandwidth? A lot of this has to do with cognitive reframing, right? So you learn to take responsibility for, for what's going on. You want to be positive. You want to learn about what you can do and, and, um, and in, instead of thinking about just how bad things are. And you either have it or you don't. Resilience, I'm not so sure. I think you can actually learn resilience. And resilience for me is a sense of flexibility, adaptability, feeling in control, and having that balance in perspective and social support. This guy, Sean Anker, he, um, he uh, is, is a guy who's very, um, on the, uh, <laughs> I guess he's a very popular speaker in TED Talks and so on. But he talks about the happiness advantage. And, and he basically, his premise is that, you know, if we're taught that we work hard, we, we're, we'll, we'll be successful. And once we're successful, then we'll become happy. But in fact, the opposite is probably true. Because the research that at least Sean and a lot of other people are doing is that if you start by being happy, you start by being positive, you frame it from the get-go with positivity that the rest will follow. You'll become uh, more engaged, more creative, more, more motivated, more energetic, and in turn, more resilient. And that kind of resonated with me. So strategies for ED teams dealing with stress. So at our, at our shop, I, I try, in a busy shift, I try and go to the doc's room and sit there for, you know, a minute or two and uh, don't look at my phone and just kind of uh, reflect. And you know, some people use Calm or Headspace just to have a, a quick meditation. I try to get outside as much as possible with my friends, and that helps me. We, we do a lot of uh, extracurricular stuff through our Emerge. We have a, a very cohesive team, and uh, I won't comment on the safety of getting on bikes and riding around town and drinking beers. And the mother of all debriefs, everyone here is, re is wearing their Ride for Ollie t-shirt, and they're debriefing them, you know, on, on what happened and basically letting off steam. And that, this, this kind of thing can't be underestimated. One of our nurses, uh, well, a few of our nurses are, are very involved in wellness in our, our shop. So we, this is posted in our door where most of us exit. So you want to take a moment to think about your day and acknowledge one thing that was difficult on your shift and then let, let that go. Consider three things that you thought went well. Reflect on those. And then check on your colleagues. Check on yourself. And then you want to go home, hug your kids, reframe, rest, recharge.
And this, this kind of thing is, seems simple, but sometimes need a reminder. There's been a lot of research into critical incident stress debrief uh, with family, friends of the victims. And there is some evidence that actually debriefing these victims uh, can bring up negative uh, memories of the whole, whole incident and can make it very difficult for them to recover. But what about people who see these things again and again and again? How do you stress debrief and get them ready to face the next, the next thing? And that's it's a very difficult thing to do. Some people, there is research that critical incident stress debrief can help with these teams, and, and everyone's different. And what happens when these two things intersect? And this is what was happening with, with Ollie. And that really muddies the waters, and it's really difficult for people to actually recover from this. So what happened? So I went to one of these, uh, introduce yourself. I went there with a bunch of nurses and docs, and you, you, um, you talk about the facts of the case. You talk about your initial thoughts at the time. And then your reactions, and you know, most people's reactions are, I can't sleep very well, I'm irritable, I'm not, you know, I'm short with my wife, uh, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, and those are normal, those are normal. And it's all about normalizing those symptoms, it's about teaching how to deal with those symptoms and how to deal with stress management, and then going back to work and facing the next critical incident. The Employee and Family Assistance Program is, is what helps us. I don't know if it's available everywhere at every shop, but uh, it should be and uh, worth looking into or whatever supports your, your, um, your hospital. Environment. Like I said, this is our recess bay. It's got wayfinding. It's got the hot zone on the floor there. You can see our hot zone here. We've got, um, we're very blessed. We have uh, often a few docks, although not only, at nighttime we only have one. But, uh, you know, if there are three docs, then you split them into the leader at the foot of the bed, super important, not to touch the patient. Then you got the procedure ERP doing the primary survey, and then you got the airway ERP at the, at the top of the bed. And these are all written on the floor, easy to find. That's where you stand, and that's where the patient goes. And we have often enough nurses, so five nurses are gonna be helping you out. Uh, if you only have two or three nurses, then that makes that hard, because those nurses have to do a couple jobs. And we're, we're blessed to have an RT as well, which often takes away another doc or a paramedic. Whistler has a very small recess bay and they see uh, very sick trauma patients and they're really pushing for expanding that trauma, trauma bay. Uh, because when you get in there with a sick patient, it is, I've worked up there, it's incredibly cramped. I've tried to run a recess station there and it's very, very hard. We hold a procedures course at Lionsgate. Every year or two, we get together for a morning and an afternoon, and we teach each other these skills that we don't do very often. Open cricothyrotomy is one of them. We talk about transtracheal jet ventilation, how to landmark, how to set up, how to set up your, your um, equipment. My station the last time was lateral canthotomy for retrobulbar hematoma, and we had a bunch of pig's heads that we were practicing on, which work really well. And we went over pericardiocentesis. And in fact, we had a sim on this in our emerged uh, last, a few, I guess, a month or two ago. And it really highlighted how our pericardiocentesis tray was built before the age of ultrasound. And now we had to totally uh, look at the systems and look at, look at what we're going to stock for, for getting into that pericardium. So super helpful there. And more procedures, Sim, we're, you know, this is um, Ross Brown, eminent Ross Brown, who is an ex-military surgeon who is going over ED thoracotomy because he's done a lot of them. And he looked at our tray and he basically threw out half of it and he said, this is what you need. And he went over the procedure and it was incredibly helpful for something that I don't think, well, <laughs> not many people I know have done this, a few. The team, so my passion, teamwork makes the dream work. How do, you, how do you prepare the team? And you guys have probably heard this in other lectures. Crisis resource management is incredibly important for the team. It's all about preventing errors. So you can see here in the Swiss cheese model that if you have these errors, these latent failures that exist in your system or these active failures during the resuscitation, then if all the holes line up, that's where the errors are going to happen and that's where badness happens to your patient. It's not because of a lack of skill, but it's really because of a lack of organization, a lack of, of avoiding those pitfalls at every layer of cheese. 
So, so key points for CRM, you know, call for help early. We, you know, in our place, we have this activation where the switchboard calls everybody. Uh, but it's got to be automated as much as possible so that all the key players get there as fast as possible. You want to be knowing your environment. You want to be very aware of your hot zone, where people stand and where the equipment is and how you use that equipment. Use cognitive aids and figure out what's labeled and, and what isn't labeled and what needs to be labeled. Role clarity. Antici sorry, anticipate and plan. So you're, you're wanting, wanting to have that shared mental model when you're when doing a resuscitation. And if you have that situational awareness, then that allows you to set dynamic priorities, allows you to plan, allows you to do that airway plan, that plan A, B, C, and D, and really get everybody on the same page that, so that an effective um, plan is always happening. And that requires effective team leadership and followership. And it's really so important to, to designate a team, team leader. And as we saw in that video, one of you pointed out that the, the leader was really, no really, nobody, when the surgeon showed up, nobody really knew what was going on. And then, it, then even the nurse was trying to lead at one point. And I still see this in our shop, and we still, it's still happening, and I still see resuscitations that are not done very well, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that the team leader is not standing back as much as they should and giving the plan and calming things down and directing things in a very orderly manner. They're, they've got their head and their hands in the bloody patient, and it's very, very ineffective for a good, a good um, uh, well, well effect, effectively run simulation. Establish that role clarity, and, and the, you, know, you really want to know the patient people's names in your, in your shop. And in a smaller center, it's a lot easier, but you know, where we have 100 nurses, it's often important to introduce everybody and make sure everybody knows who's doing what. And then you want to have that effective communication. You guys have heard this, I'm sure, but you want to close that loop. You want to cite the name, and you want to have clear instructions. And that's so, so important. And we use this a lot. You know, we stop, especially when we've done every, everything we think we should do, and we kind of summarize the case and say, okay, what's going on here? What's our plan? Where are we going next? And this kind of thing can be incredibly helpful. Just a plug for Struck. So this is modeled after the start course in Alberta. Our own Hazel Park uh, runs this, and she uh, has started this from scratch uh, in BC just to to do a roadshow of uh, high fidelity simulations and airway stations. Uh, and they, she'll take it to your place of work and work with your team in your environment to really help you plan using site crisis resource management princi principles. So it comes down to the patient. You know, the patient's why we're there. And, uh, you know, poor Ollie. Uh, you know, <laughs> everyone was there for Ollie. And we really did not want to do any harm for Ollie. How do you... One, deal with the emotion of that, but then also cognitively reframe. And one way to do this is through cognitive forcing. And I'll give you an example. Like, what's the most commonly missed fracture? The second fracture, exactly. So um, the second fracture, so we, we're we teach ourselves to use cognitive forcing strategies to check the joint above, joint below. If someone's got bi bilateral calcaneal fractures. We're checking the spine for fractures. These are cognitive forcing strategies that have been drilled into us. And we need to use these at all times during the resuscitation. And you want to be forcing yourself to be thinking, OK, you know, something's going on in the chest. Have we checked the belly? Where is the bleeding coming from? And you don't want to be focusing and going down these many cognitive errors that can happen. And there's a lot of groupthink that happens in a, in, uh, in a recess. And beware, there are risk persuaders lurking among us, and they are strong-willed, and they, they will be telling us what's going on and telling us what to do. And this goes both ways. So you have a, if you have a team that you don't know very well, often people will follow, blind, follow the leader blindly. But also, if the team knows ex each other very well, a highly co cohesive group, then they will uh, feel nice and, and, uh, and safe in this warm cocoon of, of people that they know well. And oftentimes, oftentimes, we can keep going down the wrong path. So cuss is the greater assertiveness. So you might be speaking up and saying, you know, I'm concerned that this patient's airway may not remain patent. And that progresses to, listen, I'm really not certain that we should be sending this patient on transfer without a protected airway. And the third one is, well, you escalate that more. You say, listen, this is unsafe. And then you stop and you reframe. 
And anyone in the room should be able to speak up and do this. There should be a flat hierarchy when it comes to cuss or cognitive forcing strategies or reframing the conversation, avoiding those pitfalls in the Swiss cheese. Uh, so how do you prevent loss of control in all four of these domains? Well, you know, it, it, it really, a, a big, big tool in this simulation, and this talk is not all about simulation, but simulation is one of the answers to this. And, you know, this is a sim from a few weeks ago where we had a, a pregnant trauma patient come in uh, with a high fidelity sim and a, you know, a, a belly, a fake belly on her. We had OB come down and we, you know, it was really incredible watching, watching the team work together and look at the systems involved with dealing with two patients at once. Um, and super, super effective sim. And I gotta say, you look at this sim compared to the sim that we did when we first started our program five years ago, and it is night and day. And it's, it's really, really incredible how well it's run now. We're also doing telesim. We started this up, this is Bella Coola. Uh, we, we control the, the doll remotely. Uh, from Lionsgate, and there's Richard on the right, who's our sim tech guy, and then we're also running a, a, a sim in parallel down in uh, at Lionsgate to uh, to kind of smooth things out and make sure that that all the equipment uh, issues are are smooth. And it was really really well received up in Bellacula, and this kind of thing is happening all over BC. And if it's not in your shop, it should be. OR has just started doing sims and. Uh, I can tell you from the codes I've been to in the OR this year, they've got a long way to go uh, because it's usually chaotic up there when, when uh, things go sideways. And we have some fun with it. This is a Christmas Day sim we had this last year, uh, and poor Santa uh, got the Lucas put on him. He ended up uh, getting back on the sled and delivering presents that night. We try to make it really realistic. You know, we, we use makeup to simulate burns. And these are the dolls that go on the road, uh, and they are 3D printed silicone models. And it is eerie when you see this patient when you walk in the, the recess bay because it looks and feels almost like a real human. There's our teenager. So, you know, a lot of people do SIM on computer, which this is great, but it's not a it's it's not a, a great um, it's not the best way to do this, I think. I think you need a simulated patient. Uh, and the simulated patient with just speaking happens a lot in exam situations. Uh, the procedural simulation we're, we're now doing at our, our shop every year or two. And then down on the bottom is clinical immersion, which is what, what I'm talking about here, where we get all, the whole team and the whole system working to try and, try and uh, help with this, this resuscitation. And of course, there's crossover. You're practicing and you're assessing, but the most important part thing here, here is feedback. And the debrief process is uh, incredibly helpful. And I've, I've gone through some courses for, for debrief where you gather information, you assess what's going on, you analyze what's going on, and then you summarize, and that's where all the learning is. And, and really, I can't um, say this enough that feedback is where it all, it all happens, all the magic happens. So here's Ollie. Uh, he's a week into his hospital stay, and thankfully, he's on the mend. Go. Good. And step. Good. And the other foot, move this foot. Way up forward. There you go. And step. Good. Good boy, Ollie. This is good. Last time I started crying when I saw this. Good and boy. Move, move this leg forward. Good. And push it down. Good. And step with this one. Good job. So it's still holding a lot of emotional impact for me, and we're now six months later. So here he is, 10 days post, walking on his own. Four-year-olds are amazing, amazingly resilient. So Ollie has a left homonymous hemianopsia from his in brain injury. Uh, whenever we take photos of Ollie, he always cocks his head, drives his parents nuts. And uh, if you remember from med school, uh, number seven, when it's disrupted, you get that homonymous hemianopsia. Here's Ollie in the summer, and the they family had a good summer. Um, so I just want to give you guys a bit of a manifesto. You know, this, 
this is difficult to do, and there's a lot of barriers to implementing sim where you work. Uh, there's, you can't get money, you can't get time. Uh, there's, um, how many people here have a, any kind of sim in their shop? So everyone's got something going on. Um, I would say that they're, you're probably not doing it enough, uh, because I know we, we're not. And you, it's probably not as high fidelity as it should be, or it's not involving systems, or there's something that you need to work on. And I would encourage you to contact, um, contact me to, uh, if you have any, any uh, questions about how to set up a, an effective trauma program or effective sim in your area. So we talked about uh, self, you know, like what's, what are your strategies for, for resilience? Uh, how do you uh, uh, deal with critical incident stress? And what kind of extracurricular activities are helpful? We talked about environment, how you set up your recess bay, how you use um, these uh, strategies to label and provide cognitive aids and um, set up your recess bay so it's an effective um, uh, environment to do an effective resuscitation and practice those procedures that you really don't do very often. The team, really, it's all about crisis resource management. It's all about practice. It's all about sim. And it can't be stated enough that if you don't have these principles happening, that stuff will go wrong. And the patient needs us, and that's why we're there. And we've got to use our cognitive strategies to... The patient needs us. We've got to use those cognitive strategies to really uh, make sure that the patient is safe throughout. So are you prepared for HALO? Are you prepared for those events that are going to show up in your emergency? And I would argue that even in a rural center, it's even more important to prepare more because you're, you really don't see this as much as, as, uh, as we do. And we, we have an issue with it. bcsimulation.ca is a great repository for all things sim in BC. And it's a lots of free open access sim curriculum. And I'd, I uh, point you there. And you can get access to the VCH stuff if you just um, email me, and I'll, I'll set you up with it. That's my email. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening.